What do you think happens when you, if you were to drop yourself into a freezing cold tub of water? Well, most people would think, oh my God, you'll go into shock. You could have a heart attack. You could die. You'll get hypothermic. But what if I told you that doing this on a regular basis in an intentional way could actually heal many of the ailments that you may be suffering from, or even just optimize your body and optimize your, your performance? Would you think I was crazy? Some of you may be nodding your heads. You already know all about cold exposure. But for those of you who are not as familiar with cold exposure, today's guest is a total gift. Her name is Adrienne Jezik. She is the CEO and co-founder of Morosco Forge, and she's got an incredible story to share, as well as incredible information about this really unusual and transformational therapy. So strap on your seatbelts, grab a hot cup of tea, maybe in a blanket, and get ready to be wowed. If you were looking to connect with Adrian, you can find her at moroscoforge.com. You can also find her on Instagram under the same handle or under her name. All that information is going to be in the show notes. Remember, of course, that everything we talk about in this episode is for information purposes only. If you think that you want to try cold water therapy for yourself, then make sure, and especially if you have a health condition, make sure that you check with your provider and make sure that you get a coach. Uh, you're going to want to get uh, some training with this. This isn't the kind of thing you just want to jump into willy nilly. So check with your health provider, your medical provider first, and then get some coaching, maybe from Adrian herself. If you're looking to connect with me, you know, you can find me through my website, which is natnidham.com or on Facebook in the Optimizing Superhuman Performance Group. And when you join the group, make sure you leave me your email because I'm starting a newsletter. I've got a course coming. I've got a retreat coming. So much going on. So you're going to want to keep in touch. Thanks so much for being here. I so appreciate you guys. Enjoy the episode. Welcome, Adrian Jezik, to the show. I am so excited for this episode. <laughs> Thank you, Natalie. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. Well, you know, we had the pleasure for you guys, for those of you listening in, we had the pleasure of meeting at the Upgrade Labs conference. It was Upgrade Labs, right? Yeah. At the Upgrade Labs <laughs> conference just this past September. And well, I mean, Adrian's one of these women. She walks into the room, it lights up, everything changes, the energy shifts. It's like you are an amazing, amazing human being, Miss Adrian. And I'm so honored to have you here today. Thank you, Natalie. I'm happy to know you. It's been a joy getting to know you, and I'm excited to be here as well. Mm -hmm. Also, this is the woman who talked me into a six degree at Celsius, which is a 30, 32 degree, 30 degree uh, tub of ice water, which I swore up, down and sideways, I would never do. So that's just a little insight into just how special this person is. And um, we're going to start with your story, Miss Adrian. We're going to talk about what got you here because you have such an amazing story. And, um, you know, being the founder, owner of Morosco Forge and which is we'll talk about by the end of the show, but really let's talk about you and where you started with all this and how you got to do what you do today. Yes. I'm happy to share. Uh, I lived my whole life, a healthy, vibrant, energetic person, no allergies, no major illnesses, uh, one broken bone, a couple broken bones uh, from an accident, but no big deal yeah. until I hit my early thirties and I got really sick really fast. Within one year, I gained 50 pounds. I received three diagnoses, uh, three different autoimmune conditions, uh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, eosinophilic esophagitis, and urticaria. Within the first two years, I was put on more than 20 prescription pills, vitamins, supplements. I tried naturopath. I tried acupuncture, massage, detoxes, cleanses, juices, you name it. I tried it. And it was a few years of being really sick before I started to explore uh, different alternatives. Right. So I have a question for you. What started this just out of the blue? Like, did, can you, it was, can you it was completely out of the blue. It started where I was getting this heartburn and it was a lot worse than standard heartburn. It was also a lot worse than GERD. Uh, GERD can be really extremely painful. And what was happening with me is I couldn't drink water. I couldn't eat food. It was so bad that it was affecting my ability to take anything in orally. No kidding. And 
Yeah. So eosinophilic esophagitis is an autoimmune condition where your, your allergies present in your esophagus. So whether you're allergic to food or seasonal allergies or like pet dander, whatever it is you're allergic to presents as hives in your esophagus, those hives kind of blister and then burst and send acid through the system. So it's a gastrointestinal autoimmune disorder that affects everything you do, breathing, drinking, Mm. eating, I mean, just standing outside. And all of a sudden at 32 years old, I was becoming allergic to things I'd been around my entire life, eggs, peanuts, soy, bananas, uh, everything that grows in Arizona. I've now lived here 17 years and I was becoming allergic to everything that grew in Arizona. All of a sudden, it was like my immune system and my histamine reaction just didn't know what to do with itself. It was just a bundle bundle of confused communication. Well, and probably, yeah, probably all those tight junctions that normally keep allergens out got damaged in the gut. And, you know, so now everything gets presented to your immune system as a problem, which is really just trying to keep up at this point. Right. So, yes. And you know, I went the traditional route. I listened to my doctors. I listened, listened to my specialists. I did what they told me to do because I trusted medicine. And I thought, well, I'm really sick. I've got a chronic illness. If I, you know, I'm listening to my specialists say, if you don't take these pills, you die. Mm-hmm. And I also through this process developed in an identity as a chronically ill person. So I went from being this healthy, vibrant, you know, able to kind of handle my life to sick in bed, sometimes up to 14, 15, 16 hours a day, sometimes not being able to go to work because I couldn't get out of bed. I didn't have the energy. My body was in such pain. Uh, my personal relationships were deteriorating. I never had energy for social functions. My marriage was deteriorating because I didn't have any energy for my marriage. Uh, my kids were suffering. My two step boys, my beautiful babies from another mother, uh, my relationships with them was suffering because I just didn't have energy for anything. All my life consisted of in that first couple of years of illness was trying to survive. And I was in a complete survival mode, discovering new things all the time that were offenders. So I couldn't go to a movie theater or a restaurant and sit down because if someone near me had perfume on, it could send me into a shock. Um, I couldn't fly a plane. Heaven forbid I was on a plane and somebody had some Mm -hmm. Axe body spray or something like that. I wouldn't have been able to survive that flight. So my life was just diminishing before my very eyes. And in the meantime, I'm carrying 50 pounds extra weight. It was just so much all at once and really quickly. I mean, it was just a couple of months from the first onset of symptoms to full diagnosis, way overweight, completely uncomfortable, in pain all the time. Wow. Now, at the height of my disease... I, like I said, I was taking more than 20 different prescription pills, vitamins, and supplements. I was still overweight. I started a low inflammation food regimen. I thought, you know, the first place to start taking over my life, like I had to do an elimination diet to figure out what foods I was allergic to because the allergy prick test doesn't tell you like what's offending you on the inside. Yeah. So I did the elimination food regimen and then I moved into a low inflammation food regimen. Um, Dr. Terry Walls developed the Walls protocol to help with her symptoms of MS. And a friend of mine, my dear friend, Cindy told me about this. She says, Hey, one of my clients tried this book. They had MS, but it changed their life. Maybe it'll help you. And it did help. It helped a lot. I was getting energy back. I was able to learn the benefits of cooking with whole foods. I was learning about what ingredients I was putting into my body. So it was no longer, oh, I'm gluten-free. I'll go for gluten-free pasta. Yeah. That's not how that works. Not so much. Um, when I switched out pasta altogether for spaghetti squash, oh my gosh, my whole life changed. <laughs> uh, but I was learning how to cook squash. with, yeah, I was learning how to cook with whole ingredients, which meant I could have an entire meal with three ingredients or less. Yeah. And then if I had an offending reaction to that meal, I knew exactly what it was that was causing it. Sure. So even though this food regimen helped with my energy levels, helped me figure out what my offenders were, it never helped me lose any weight and it didn't change any of the symptoms from my illness, from any illness that I had been diagnosed with. Right. Well, that so makes I was sense. On 
I was on this regimen for two whole years before I first discovered deliberate cold exposure. <laughs> and we are folks. I was not <laughs> excited. <laughs> I was not excited at all. I grew up in Florida. I lived in Hawaii. Phoenix summers are still my favorite time of year. I still four years into this practice, I still prefer heat to cold. And I was at my wits end. I would have tried anything when I was learning what I was learning in books at the time, what I was learning through other people in my circle in health and wellness was that the cold had the power to at least help with inflammation. Mm -hmm. And I knew I was inflamed. I could feel the inflammation. I could see it in my face. I could feel it in my gut. Everywhere, everywhere I was, I felt pillowy. And like, I was just like, I couldn't put my arms down because of this tire around my belly. And, you know, it's just incredibly uncomfortable, not to mention how much harder my body is working Mm -hmm. to carry this extra 50 pounds. For sure. So when I say I was at my wits end, I mean, I was depressed. I was struggling to get out of bed. Even when I felt good, I was struggling to see any hope for a future or any hope for getting my life back. And, and it was hard. It was really hard. And so when my husband said, Hey, I'm going to try this, I'm going to throw a trough in our backyard. I'm going to invite some friends over for some breath work. Everyone's going to bring some ice and we're going to do some breath work. And then we're going to take ice baths. And he says, you're welcome to join. And I didn't want to, I really didn't want to, but it was in my backyard. What was I going to do? Run away. I mean, I wanted to just go back to sleep. And this is October, (laughs) November, this is November of 2017. Okay. So so go outside, we do the breath work. We put all the ice and the water in the trough. It was just a metal horse trough. And I took my first ice bath. I was so freaked out that there was no way I was getting in that water. So I had to violently drop myself in the water. I put one foot on each side of the tub. I put one hand on each side of the tub. I hovered over top of it and I dropped myself in. You did not. I have a video of this online. Oh yes. my God. I, I dropped myself worse. in. <laughs> I went underwater. I held my breath. Then I leapt out. I freaked out. Turns out it was nine seconds. My very first ice bath That's was good. nine seconds. And it was nine. violent. It was aggressive. Sorry, I thought you said 90, but nine seconds. Yeah. No, okay. nine seconds. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine. seconds. Well, that would be about the time it would take you to like get your footing and leap out of there. Right. Like to just yeah. get out. Yeah, as soon as I realized what was going on, I got the heck out. <laughs> well, and your brain would be screaming at you, frankly, we're going to die. <laughs> That's yes. exactly how it felt. That's exactly how it felt to say that fight or flight was activated. That's an understatement. No kidding. And after I got done freaking out, I noticed for the first time in years, I wasn't in pain. Really? I used to get this leg pain in my legs. It felt like I was just being beaten with a sledgehammer. Sometimes I couldn't put shoes on or push a gas pedal on a car. That's how bad this pain hurt. No pain pill ever got rid of it. No massage ever got rid of it. No acupuncture ever got rid of it. No juice cleanse, detox, or anything I did could get rid of this pain until I did nine seconds in a nice bath. Wow. And the way that I felt the mental clarity, the emotional relief that I got from having no pain in my body was enough to send me over the moon in joy. Hmm. Interesting. And I knew I was going to do it again. Not that day. Yeah. <laughs> I was not going to do it again that day, but I knew I was going to do it again. And sure enough, it was either a week later or maybe two weeks later, we did it again. That's so amazing and fascinating. And it brings up this idea of stress and a hormetic stress versus an overwhelming stress to the body. And, you know, a lot of people would say that the state that you were in, your body was in constant sympathetic overload. Like you were, your, your system's in fight or flight, literally, because it's being, it's under attack from, from within, from outside, from in many, many ways. And intuitively, most people would say, well, wait a minute, Adrian, wouldn't that be the worst time to expose your body to yet another stress, right? Because that would almost say, well, this goes beyond a hormetic stressor and moves into the world of maybe stress that will overload the system. So 
do you want to talk about that a little bit? <laughs> because I actually, you know, I think it's one of the big, it's one of the big question marks. I won't even call it a myth, but it's one of those things that people are always circling around. Like when is, when is it too much? And would this be too much? Like, shouldn't you be like at your more resilient, most resilient before you expose your body to this kind of a stressor? So off you go. <laughs> yeah. One of, one of my favorite questions is like, how do I know when is the right time? Like yeah. a lot of times my clients will say, you know, I just don't feel it today. I don't have the energy. I don't have the strength. I don't have what it takes. And it sounds like it's going to be too much for me today. And I say, when you're in that state, when you feel like everything is too hard and anything you do is going to be too much, that's when you need a nice bath the most. Interesting. Here's why it's passive. It's instant. You show up, you sit down, you breathe, you feel better. That's it. So when you are at your wits end with exhaustion and pain and energy, and you have nothing left to give Mm -hmm. and you want to refill and a reset, and you want to put it all back, that's when you take an ice bath. And I've also been asked, like, how do I know if I'm too metabolically compromised? How do I know if my body has been pushed too far that this, this experience, this healing modality may be too extreme for me. Mm -hmm. I've never seen it. I've not seen it yet. Everyone I've ever met, no matter where you on your journey, where you are on your journey, whether you're working on an autoimmune condition, traumatic brain injury, or if you're just trying to feel better and optimize your health, that's a great time to take an ice bath, show up, sit down, breathe and feel better. Amazing. So can we talk a little bit about what's happening in the body from that extreme, right? Because, you know, there's a, there's a a reshuttling of blood flow from extremities into the center. And then when you come out, you know, and people talk about what happens in the bath, but it's also so like so many things it's the after effect. It's what happens when you come out of the bath, because I've done cryotherapy and then which where I experienced that endorphin rush when you come out and your part of it is your brain going, Oh, thank God. She's not trying to kill us. <laughs> but, but, you know, even when that day you got me into the ice, um, I, you know, and I struggled with a couple of things we can also talk about, you know, when I was in the ice that got me out a lot sooner than I would have liked, but but that feeling when you come out is really exceptional. And I, you know, you've alluded to it and talked about it a little bit, but let's talk a bit about physiologically what happens in the body, which probably would explain why the autoimmune, like all of those different conditions kind of respond, can respond positively to it. Yeah. It's it's a shock to the system. And (laughs) I think, I think of autoimmune as like a dog without a job. Hmm. So we go through our lives in these climate controlled environment to climate controlled environment. We don't ever have to starve because food is everywhere we look. Uh, We don't have to push ourselves physically because there's a way that we can cut those corners no matter what we're doing. We can drive instead of walking. We can take an elevator instead of stairs. We don't ever have to be thirsty, hungry, tired, or any of it. We don't have to stress our bodies. Yeah. And so when our bodies have no job to do, they start to turn on themselves. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what was happening in my body as it was starting to turn on itself. And when I started to introduce this external modality, it was like, yeah, Adrian's trying to kill me. This 33 degree water. So a couple of things, I think the water needs to be below 35 degrees in order to create this type of metabolic change in autoimmune, in cancer, when you're trying to really change your body. Mm -hmm. You want to shock your system. So you want that temperature to be under 35. You want to get in all the way to the neck because you want to stimulate the vagus nerve. You want to drop your hands and your feet, even though they're going to tingle because that's, that's exercising your vascular system, which is really important for your circulation. Yeah. And when you're doing this, Your body does think you're going to die. Once you get into freezing temperatures up to the neck, your body's fight or flight is activated. And you have some choices here. You can get out, you can succumb to fight or flight, or you can understand that you're in charge, that this is not actually dangerous. This is good for your body. And so what happens when your body goes into that fight or flight, we're going to hyperventilate. And that's an opportunity for us to regulate our own breath in a fight or flight situation. So we're teaching ourselves emotional resilience. 
All of our body temperature goes to the core to protect the internal organs. So you start feeling that tingling in your hands and your feet also because your vascular system is going through a constrictor response, which is not typical of any other, any other exercise we do. We need freezing cold water in order to do this. It doesn't happen in cryo. Also because in cryo, your hands, your feet, your ears, your head, everything's covered. Yeah, it's cold air. So it only touches the surfaces of the skin, whereas cold water actually penetrates the system. Yes. So your immune system goes into overdrive. Again, your body thinks you're dying here. So it's like, whatever I have to do to keep you alive, I'm going to do it. Your metabolism kicks into gear. All of your systems, your white blood cell count starts to go into overdrive. All of your systems are coming back online in a way that's almost like a defibrillator for your for your body clock. It's like, we have to shock you. We have to wake you up. We have to get you online and we have to make sure you don't die. Yeah. All this happens in two minutes, two minutes for max health benefits. Then you get out. And yes, that's when the real work starts to come in. You're developing those cold shock proteins. You've got norepinephrine and dopamine coursing through the body. So you're feeling stronger. You're feeling better. You're feeling calm and at ease. When you step out of the cold also, and the body's no longer trying to fight to survive, the body can start settling back into what its regular systems are. Mm -hmm. But we've just given it a shock. We just gave it that defibrillator shock. So it's like your immune system's going, whoa, all right, I'm alive. I get it. I have a job to do here. Your (laughs) circulatory system, all the heat's rushing back into your extremities. So you're getting this whoosh of constriction in your vascular system. And then this whoosh of heat of opening your vascular system. So you're working out your vascular system in ways that none of us do. No. So this is going to help for when I am standing in 40 degree weather, or I am sitting in a cold restaurant having lunch, I can just take a deep breath and remind myself, this is what cold feels like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a lot of times this is why we're in such shock at these temperatures, because we have no idea what cold feels like. So my favorite thing to tell people when they're sitting down into freezing water is this is what cold feels like. Then we can start to get an association of the physical sensation to the body and the mental processing of, oh, this is how it's supposed to feel. Yeah. Well, in a way, and I will say, speak to my experience with you, you, a lot of the work that you're doing with people as you prepare us through breath work before we go into the ice and once we're in the ice is dealing with that fear response, right? Yes. It's turning off, like, well, I don't know if it's turning off the fear response as much as it's, you've got this, you're in control of this, you choose this, there's nothing to be afraid of because- You're also- learning how to manage it. I'm teaching yeah. you how to manage that fear response because how, how many of us have ever actually been in an extreme situation, like a fire, you know, where you have to think, what are the- the five things that I would grab or what would I do in that situation? We often don't know. You can do fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. We've got four different potential reactions to any emergency situation, to any fight or flight situation. And what I'm teaching you to do prior to even stepping in is how to maintain your breath, maintain your calm through that experience. So that when that does happen, like out in the, in the world, or, you know, maybe you're in a car accident, maybe an extreme accident happens, maybe a fire happens, like any number of things you've already been trained, you know, what your response is, you can breathe through that. Mm -hmm. And when we can learn to remain calm in our body's most physical reaction, that fight or flight response, we're teaching ourselves emotional resilience above and beyond what therapy can teach us, above and beyond what a mindful meditative practice can teach us. This is actively putting ourselves in that state so that we can train ourselves how to move through it. And that's been one of the greatest responses for me is that emotional regulation component because I grew up not knowing how to emotionally regulate. My father's bipolar schizophrenic. So all my coping mechanisms were modeled after that type of behavior. And so years of dialectical behavioral therapy, you know, you talk, you learn, you're like, all right, this is what I want to do next time. Nothing launched me into that emotional regulation the way that ice baths did. That's amazing. I, and it is, it is the breadth of impact of ice baths is really remarkable. Now I want to talk a little bit about the type of breath work that you do, because it's a little bit different than what a lot of the breath work. And I don't know if we want to mention anything by name. I mean, I'm cool. Yeah. yeah Wim Hof. Is but, so very, Wim Hof, 
you know, Wim Hof kind of opened people's eyes to this whole concept of of deliberate cold exposure by immersing yourself into water. And I mean, he's done all kinds of crazy things. And he's clearly a guy that has amazing control over his body. Um, you know, like, I mean, there's that vice um, documentary that they shot about him, which you guys, if you haven't seen it, I highly encourage you to watch it. But the way that you, you coach people in breath before and going into the ice is quite different from that style. So do you want to talk about that a little bit? Like just how they're different and why you do things so differently? Yes. Well, first I'll say I love Wim Hof. I love his breath work and it has a place. I love the way that he's introduced this to mainstream and he's getting everybody on board with the ice. Like bravo. I love it. And that's more of like the yang energy. That's the hyperactive holotropic uh, high energy type of experience. And what I discovered while doing Wim Hof breath work prior to me taking ice baths was that it was putting me in a state of anxiety, this high energy, competitive energy that I was going to meet the ice and I was going to own the ice and I was going to, you know, do all these things just like Wim Hof because I'm super tough. I'm so awesome. And meeting it with that competitive energy. What I realized through this practice was that I lived the first 30 some odd years of my life in that state of challenging energy, in that state of competition, and that here in this stage of my life, especially as someone who had gotten sick, Mm -hmm. that it was time for me to surrender. It was time for me to meet my life with calm and grace. It was time to put the fighter to bed and allow the warrior to take over. So I wasn't in that constant state of high energy, competitive, um, yang energy. Mm -hmm. So as I was moving through my own deliberate cold exposure practice and realizing that the Wim Hof energy was just too high energy, too challenging, too competitive, I learned that I needed to meet it with surrender and grace, but I didn't quite know how. And what I discovered was that I had all of these tools already. Through dialectical behavioral therapy, I learned sensory immersion, how to use all five of my senses to ground myself when I'm in an emotional or anxious, anxious state through, um, spa living in the spa and being a previous esthetician and doing hair. I learned about aromatherapy and light therapy and how we can use all of these different things to ground ourselves in the moment for calm. I also realized that even though that yang competitive energy works for many people, it's not going to work for everyone. And there really ought to be more than one option. Mm -hmm. So as I was meeting the cold and realized that this high energy, this competition wasn't working for me, I had to develop my own method for meeting the cold with grace and surrender. So I began to incorporate dialectical behavioral therapy by engaging all five senses in grounding myself in sensory immersion. I use a method of box breathing and a guided meditative hypnotic experience to talk you down into a calm and grounded state prior to ever even stepping into the water. I use all of these things because whatever has happened in the water hasn't happened yet. Yeah. By teaching ourselves how to remain and put ourselves in this calm state prior to entering or experiencing that anxious experience, we're teaching ourselves how to ground ourselves in the moment. Once I started to do that, I was able to enter the water calmly instead of that drop in freak out challenge. So I was able to enter the water calmly, move through my breath calmly, sit in for two whole minutes in a calm state of mind, and then exit with purpose. Also upon exit, I like to, uh, while you're in the water, I like to use a sound bowl, yep. uh, the sound bowl tied to the crown chakra to keep you open of energy and free of this experience. And then the sound and the reverberations against the water and the metal of the tub, it puts you into this additional state of calm. Yep. And then when you step out of the water, we do not do anything high energy. We're not going into horse stance and heavy breathing. We're not wrapping up in a towel. We stand in a power pose. And if you want to Google this, this is really funny. The, the pose is actually called arms akimbo. Yep. So you're standing just like 
um, Wonder Woman or Superman, your feet are slightly wider than hip distance apart. Your hands are in fists on your hips with your thumbs pointing behind you. Your chest is out. Your shoulders are down. Your chin is up and you're just breathing calmly immediately after exiting the ice. When you might be shivering and you might be really cold, you're standing in this power pose because I want you to feel and create a physical muscle memory of empowerment. Yeah. If you jump into high energy physical exercise, or if you wrap up in a towel, or if you're freaking out, you're creating a muscle memory from that anxious state. Mm. When you stand in a power pose, which is actually called arms akimbo, when you stand, they call it a power pose because standing like that for two minutes changes the chemicals in your brain to create calm and confidence. Yeah. So I'm helping you create that empowered physical muscle memory of the ice as a calming experience post plunge. Yeah. After no. standing that way for about two minutes, you're developing your cold shock proteins. You're calming your breath. You're allowing the warmth to come back to your extremities. After that two minutes, you can take on the world. Yeah. I've got to, and you know what? I mean, I didn't quite make it two minutes. I made it 90 seconds. I watched the video, <laughs> which is still amazing. I know. 90 seconds, but, um, but I, the, it, and it's interesting because, because you get people into this calm state, because we come out in a calm state, not in a, oh my God, I got to get out of here state. The, the, sen- the physical and emotional sensations are spectacular. Like I yes. almost felt like I wanted to go back in, mm-hmm. which was kind of messed up, right? Because <laughs> you would think, what do you mean? How is that even possible? And, you know, for me, I, my body didn't respond particularly well to the ice this first time for whatever reason. Like I had some pretty intense pain in my traps and in my hands. So whatever it was that was going on for me that day, it wasn't for me to stay in for much longer, which I was, you know, I was very disappointed about because there is this, this part of my personality we call meathead nat that tends to get me into trouble on occasion. But there's no doubt that how you feel once you're out of there and because, again, because of the way you get people out and you coach us through, it's worth every second that you spend in the ice. I can, you know. And it's not about the amount of time. Yes, two minutes is ideal. And any amount of cold is a good amount of cold. Mm -hmm. So for your first experience to be 90 seconds, that is tremendous. And you still receive the benefits to go from never to 90 seconds. That's a huge leap. Yeah. And we are, we're training ourselves how to be calm. We're training ourselves how to move through this discomfort, that tingling in your hands, the tingling in your traps. This is all discomfort. And we can practice that away through a regular deliberate cold exposure practice. Your hands don't hurt the same way. Yeah. Your muscles don't react the same way. The more you're reducing that inflammation, the easier, the smoother your experience is going to be moving forward. That being said, if you wait too long in between, it's like starting all over again. <laughs> well, and, and you know, it's funny. And, and, and that's going to bring me to my next topic, which is that, I mean, it's not like I've never done any cold exposure before. I've done, I've done cryotherapy a number of times. And to your point, completely different experience. Um, and I'm, I'm a hot weather person. Like I was born in the heat. I was built for the heat. I talk to people all the time. I live in a place where there's, you know, a tough winter. I grew up in Montreal where there's a brutal winter and I keep telling people, my people did never had to deal with this business. Like this is not a thing for me, <laughs> not built for this, but you know, I've done cryotherapy a number of times I've gone outside when it's, you know, minus 31 degrees Celsius here in a sports bra and tights and done my kettlebell swings and whatnot and stayed out there for four or five minutes. So I've done cold, but, and I've done cold in my tub, cold showers, cold in my tub with cold tap water, but it is a very big leap between any of those things. And even though cryotherapy is what, minus 189 degrees, like something like that, like it's, it's cold. Um, you can't touch the sides of the thing. Like you turn into a cartoon character and, you know, freeze yourself, but, um, but it's a very different experience. And so can we talk a little bit about, because, you know, not everybody, like, unless they have access to a coach like you, which I would say, find one. Um, they're not necessarily going to be able to get themselves into this, this type of therapy. So 
what is the value of these other ones? Because people do talk about doing a cold shower, either I've done it before bed and seen that it can do wonders for my deep sleep or first thing in the morning for metabolic reasons. Um, so do we want to talk about all these different options and their place, if, if you will? Yes, yes. So a couple of things. I'm working on getting more certified guides all the time. So hopefully one's coming to a city near you. I also have online deliberate cold exposure meditations. This has helped a lot of my clients that I've never gotten to meet in person. They just go to our YouTube at Morales Go Forge, go to the meditation playlist, just press play. And I walk you through every step of the way. Lacey, if you're listening, I've not added an intention spot yet, but I will. Uh, and there are all kinds of ways to get your cold. Like I said, any amount of cold is a good amount of cold. If you're uncomfortable, you're doing work. Good. Yeah. That being said, the work comes at 55 or below. Okay. You really want those temperatures. They say that it starts, Ben Greenfield shared this information with me. It starts at about 55 and below. Okay. Well, that's, that's I cool. believe it needs to be cold enough to activate fight or flight. So if you don't get some sort of hyperventilative response, if you don't get a little bit of a feeling like you want to leap out of your skin, maybe find a way to make it a little colder. Yeah. Now, when it comes to cold showers, I didn't even know, I didn't even know that was the thing until about a year into my cold <laughs> practice. And also you I don't want to be pelted locally with like 60 degree water. I'd rather sit calmly in 33 degree water and not everyone has access to that. That's okay. So you have a couple of options. You can find a local facility near you that may have cold as a service. Most places only have 45 to 50 degree cold plunges. That's still going to be fantastic for you. We're working on getting forge and freezing ice baths in as many commercial facilities as possible. You can gather all your friends the same way I did. You don't have to have a trough. You could have a kiddie pool. You could do it in a bathtub. Just make sure that it's chock full of ice before you add the water, because those cubes are little, they melt quickly. So mm -hmm. what you think is an ice bath with a hundred pounds is not an ice bath. Wait, you're going to need 200, 200 plus pounds of ice to really make an ice bath. So if it's any less than 200 pounds, if you're outside and it's Phoenix summer, you've had four people go through it. It's going to be 55, 60 degrees by the time that sixth, seventh person goes in there. So Wait. keep these things in mind. 200 Cryotherapy is a great way to experience the cold. Couple of things to remember with cryo. You're covering all your important bits. So you're covering your hands, you're covering your feet, you're covering your ears, you're covering your head. And these are the places we want to get exposed. Cryo is also air. So it's going to affect the surface of the skin. So those people that grew up in Michigan or grew up in Toronto and they say, I had to walk outside in the snow all the time. Yeah, it's cold air. It's not quite the same as cold water. It's not going to penetrate the same. And with cryo, there are potential dangers. Look up Antonio Brown. He froze the skin off the bottom of his feet. No okay. So there's potential danger in cryotherapy. So it's not quite as effective and it has the potential to be a little more dangerous. So you can also DIY a chest freezer. Like a Morosco Forge is not in everyone's budget. We like to say that we are the Lamborghini of ice baths because we are top of the line. But you can do a DIY chest freezer. Ben Greenfield and Luke's story did this super cool YouTube video where they show you how to like seal all the cracks. And then you can even put a garden timer on it. Cause if you just leave it plugged in all the time, it'll turn into a solid block of ice. Yeah. So you put a garden timer on your chest freezer after you've sealed all your cracks, and then you can have a regular access to a literal ice bath. You will have to change that water a couple times a month because there's no way for you to filter it. Yeah. Um, and you do want it to be clean. It's important that when we get into bodies of water, that this water is clean. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can do the ice bath. You can do a bunch of bags with some friends. You can fill a large bowl. If you're in your home, you're emotionally dysregulated. You're having a rough day. Maybe you're even at work and it's been a really difficult day and you're struggling. Grab the largest bowl you can find. Fill it chock full of ice and add water. Dunk your face three to five times, dunk your hands three to five times, dunk your feet three to five times in that order. Don't put foot water on your face. No. And that also will have an impact on your mood that will have an impact on waking you up. 
Even if all we ever do is go to the water and splat, go to the bathroom and splash our face with water, we're activating the body's dive response. We're calming our system down. That's why when people freak out, they say, go splash your face with water. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately for women, we're often wearing makeup. So it can be a little challenging, but I say it's worth it. Ladies, it is worth it. Have your backup makeup bag at work with you. (laughs) Yeah. Or just forget, forego it. Who cares? We're the only ones looking anyway. And I, so that's what I say. You can get access to cold, no matter where you are, no matter who you are, no matter your budget, no matter your mobility, you can get access to cold. Nice. I love it. If you're making yourself under uncomfortable, you're doing it right. Any amount of cold is a good amount of cold. What about lying in the snow? I would think that would be effective to a degree. It's just going to melt around you, but yeah, it melts around you. It's not quite the same as lying in um, water. It's not the same as lying in ice water. If you bury yourself in it, maybe. And again, if you're uncomfortable, you're doing the work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I mean, yeah. you know, because we, I mean, definitely in the climate where I am, people will do this thing where they'll run out and jump into the snow. The thing is, most of the time, they're not in. You know, you'd have to be really at most in shorts and if you're a woman, a sports bra or less. Yeah. And I get that. Like, you know, sauna to roll around in the snow a little bit back to sauna, back to roll around the snow a little bit. That's effective for you. It's really good for you. It's not going to create the same type of metabolic change as freezing water up to the next. So like if you're trying to cure cancer, reverse autoimmune, like if that's what you're working on, you really need to explore your options for full body submersion at freezing temperatures. Interesting. So actually you just brought up a really interesting point. Let's talk about that contrast Mm -hmm. going from, and I'm sure that's part of maybe part of what you do is (laughs) guys, if you're not watching this and listening to this, you should see the smile on her face. Like it's blinding. Um, (laughs) I found another good question. So moving from sauna to cold, cold to sauna. And I mean, that day that, that I went into the ice, I mean, I was, I preceded a few women that one stayed in for five minutes, another one for three and a half. Like there are definitely, you can see how P and I don't know what your, your time is in the ice when you do it, but we can. And, and it's so funny because, you know, we have this fear instilled in us, right? We, especially like where I live again, like I have a, a lake on a, um, sorry, I have a cabin on a lake and the fear is, Oh my God, if you break through the lake, you have no minutes to get out of there before you're going to hypothermia is going to set in and you're done. So, so I guess I'm moving into two topics now. So number one, the sauna to cold and just that whole, that whole shock and transition. And can you do like five minutes in the cold and then move into sauna and then go back? Like, how does that all work? Tell us. Cause then I'm you get to answer eat shock opposite. proteins and so, cold shock proteins. Yeah. Yeah. So this is not instilled in us. This fear is not instilled in us. We learn this fear. That's what I mean. Like adults. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah, we learn this fear when we were kids and we were swimming and it was winter time and we were blue and we were chattering. It's five more minutes, just five more minutes. I'll have hot cocoa when I come inside, you know, like kids don't know that this is something to be afraid of. This is something we teach them. Yeah. And when it comes to length of time in the cold, here's the most important thing I want to tell everyone. Number one, minimum effective dose. Yes. It is not about five minutes, 10 minutes, Joe Rogan doing 20 minutes, my husband doing 22 and a half, Justin Wren doing 33.33 at 33 degrees. That's not what it's about. You can get diminishing returns if you are forcing this practice. Now for Justin Wren, he's been practicing for years. So he's accustomed to these temperatures. He's accustomed to this time. He needs that extra. If you're just getting started in the practice, two minutes. And if you choose to push yourself, listen to your body. If you start shaking and you're shivering and you can't stop that shiver, it's time to get out. Mm-hmm. My practice tends to be three to five minutes in the ice. Okay three to five minutes. I listen to my body. I get out when I'm ready. It tends to be three to five minutes and minimum of effective dose. Now, when it comes to contrast, and I'm a huge fan of contrast, here's why you're putting your body in extremes. Mm-hmm. Again, we've gone in all these climate controlled ways of comfort. We can layer up, we can turn on heat, we can turn on AC. We hardly experience temperature discomfort. 
And I think that contrast therapy is a great way to introduce yourself to that temperature discomfort in a safe environment. If you're new to ice baths, I suggest starting in the cold because then you're not going to sit in a sauna for 30, 40 minutes thinking about that. Two, Putting it three off. Minute ice bath, <laughs> right? It's a mental thing, especially yeah. when my clients are new to the cold. I want to start them in the cold with the promise of the sauna to warm them up post ice bath. Nice. If you are experienced, I love to start in the sauna because that way the sauna is not working so hard to warm you up from the ice bath. You're already starting at your base state. So you're not in there as long as you would have to be to get that real good detox sweat going. So if you're experienced to the cold, I like to start in the sauna and everyone knows they're good sauna. You know, like my sauna gets to 149 Fahrenheit. I know that I can be in there 30, 40 minutes. That's about a good amount of time for me. Whether you start in the sauna or in the cold or whether you're cycling, because you can go back and forth, back and forth. I recommend two to three, sometimes even four or five minutes in between each modality. And here's why. I want my body to do the work. I don't want to rely on the ice bath to cool me off post sauna. I don't rely on the sauna to warm me up post ice bath. I want my body to be in those heat shock proteins, developing those heat shock proteins post sauna. And the minute I get in the cold, that starts to stunt that. So post cold, I want those cold shock proteins to be active. I don't want to just jump right into the sauna because I don't want to deactivate my cold shock proteins. So I want my body to do the work. I want my body to warm itself up post cold. I want it to cool itself off post heat. And even if I'm cycling, I'm allowing anywhere from two to five minutes in between each of those cycles. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And then I just cycle as many times as I feel is necessary. Okay. Is there an optimal number of cycles, would you say, or. You know what I love about this practice? I think it's fully unique to the individual. Nice. I think people develop their own combo based on what makes them feel best. And you, this, these, these types of modalities, ice baths and sauna therapy, that will help you redevelop and reignite that conversation between your brain and your body yeah. in ways that I haven't seen anything else do. So if you're listening to your body, if your brain's truly listening to your body and what it needs, You're going to instinctually know when it's too much, when you need to back off, where you want to start, where you want to end. There are days I'll still start in the cold. There are days I'll still only do cold and no sauna. I don't ever do sauna and no cold, but but I'm a big fan of cold. So that's why. Yeah. I mean, Um, I'll I'll say even for me, when I do sauna, I I crave at least a cold shower on the other side. At least a cold shower. Cold shower. I mean- yeah. I won't typically go into the ice. I mean, I don't, you know, I haven't got that practice yet um, of doing it on my own, which I, me and your YouTube, you are likely to become good friends soon, but you know, uh, to try and develop that. But definitely after the sauna for me, I do, I do look for the cold to offset. Yeah. And it feels good. I mean, when you get that hot, it just, you just start to crave it. Yeah. And so I, I do think, I think both are excellent practices. I love contrast as a practice, especially if you're working on detoxification and like really clearing out your lymph, uh, contrast therapy is fantastic. And I say, trust your body, mm-hmm. you and your body are going to know what's best for you. Great. Um, so you talk about minimum effective dose in terms of time in the ice. How about minimum effective dose in terms of number of times? a week, let's say, is this something you do every day? Is this something that, you know, if you can get two in a week, you're good, or does it take three or one, you know, like even with exercise, we tell people who aren't regular exercisers, look, if you can get three workouts in a week, that's a really good kind of dose. That's, so that's kind of how I compare it is to working out. Okay. It's not great for us to work out every single day. You nope. need a day of rest. Yeah. At the same time, when I was working through autoimmune, it was important me. It was important for me to plunge every day. Interesting. And it's for the detox. It's for that lymphatic flush. It's also for the mood boost. So if you're working through depression, anxiety, if you're working through substance abuse recovery, if you're trying to heal cancer or autoimmune, then I think it's important to develop at least a near daily practice because it's going to help us mentally and emotionally 
with the physical response of what our body goes through in these types of conditions. I also think, again, any amount of cold is a good amount of cold. If you do one ice bath your entire life and you never do another one, you're a changed person. Mm -hmm. If you can get in once a month, you're doing good for your body. If you're getting in once a week, you're doing good for your body. Although ideally a near everyday practice is, is positive, is awesome for, like I said, reversing conditions. I also think there's a such thing as overdoing it. Yeah. Uh, some women struggle with cold around their cycle. I personally think it's a great way to regulate hormones, help with endometriosis, help with PCOS. Uh, I feel like this regulates even my body's pH and I practice cold around my cycles. Some women are not fans. So this is where it really comes into play of trusting your body, trusting your intuition and combining that with what access do you have? So mm -hmm. judging on what access do you have? How often can you do it? What is it you're working on? Each of these things come into play and no matter what, any amount of cold is a good amount of cold. So it's not always about doing it every single day. It's not always about doing it five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes. It's about getting it in where you can fit it in and keeping this as part of your regular practice. Love it. And so you bring up an interesting point. Also, is there anyone who shouldn't practice this practice? Like, are there certain populations of people that maybe shouldn't do it. Or, I mean, I can think of a lot of people who shouldn't do it by themselves when they're alone at home for certainly. But. Contraindications with the cold are, are strange. So I've, I've seen the cold help people heal the things that the cold caused. So yeah. syncope is a fainting as a result of extreme temperatures. And I have helped a client work through, she no longer faints as a result result of extreme temperatures okay. because we've worked through this practice together. So I think when you're starting out, always a good idea to have a buddy. First and foremost, if you're starting out, you're new to this practice, have a buddy. Don't both be in the cold or both be in the heat at the same time when you're new to this practice. Um, and I completely lost my train of thought. Natalie, will you remind me what you were saying? Yeah, no, the question was, is there anybody who oh, should, like, for example, yeah, contra like, you know, women who are pregnant so, or people with pain, heart conditions or, you know what I mean? So like you want to pay attention. You want to pay attention to syncope, which is the fainting and extreme temperatures. Yeah. Heart conditions are another one. If you have a pacemaker, I simply don't recommend it. It's one of those that it's a shock to the system and you don't want to introduce that with an electrical device in your body. So pacemakers to me are fully off the table. Now, before I go any further, I want to give a caveat and that's that I say, whatever reason you're telling yourself not to is the reason to do it. Right. And I have been told that pregnant women are contraindicators to a deliberate cold exposure practice. Mm -hmm. Now I've also worked with women who were struggling to get pregnant and within two weeks of starting their ice bath practice became pregnant. This is two separate women who are struggling for more than a year. Interesting. I have also seen women who were pregnant. And it was summertime and it's Phoenix, Arizona. So it's hot as you could imagine. And they say, if it's good for me, it's good for the baby. So I'm going to do it. Well, and so, the blood flow gets shunted to the, the core. Like the body is going to protect that baby at all costs. Yeah. I mean, if you think yeah. about it. And, that, think, and think about, so if you're, I mean, your we're not saying if you're nine months pregnant, you should do this ladies, but just saying like, if we think it through a little bit, you know, I, I wouldn't, and maybe the answer is it's what we talk about for so many things. If you are, it may not be the best time to start your deliberate cold exposure practice, but mm -hmm. if you're already doing it, it, you may be able to manage through and get the benefit. I also think this is one of those, like, if it's your first trimester, obviously there are a lot of things that can cause a shift in a pregnancy. So it's important to understand, like, you know, if you're in your first trimester, maybe hold that a little more sacred and be a little more careful. Maybe only dip the hands and the feet, see how you react. Yeah. So if you're unsure, if you have a contraindication to this practice, my recommendation is to start slowly, mm -hmm. put your feet in, see how you do, put your hands in, see how you do step all the way in and then immediately step all the way out. You don't have to stay in, just get in and get out, yeah. you know, shoot that shower over to cold and then shoot it back. See how your body responds. So you can start slowly and 
build, no matter where you are in your heart condition, in your pregnancy, and no matter what your contraindications are. Nice. So I've also worked with people with heart murmurs and then somehow they never had a heart murmur after, after developing this practice. So there are ways that this can bring your body back online and it is extreme. So yeah. use caution. Yeah, absolutely. And bring I a love friend. That. Yeah, I love that. And um, now I think you have a particular experience with something that is very counterintuitive to cold, which is Raynaud syndrome, which is when people's fingers turn white in the cold. And I think it's a vascular and they're painful. Like my husband actually has just started to develop this over the last couple of winters. I think it might be, um, a, you know, cause his mom has it. I don't know if there's a genetic, I should actually look at that. I wonder if there's a genetic, genetic component to it, but I think you, I mean, so again, so for someone like that, they'd be like, oh my God, there's no way I should ever get into the cold. And I think that you have something to say to that from experience. And that's what they think. <laughs> so I did not have Renan's a uh, woman I know and have worked closely with had Renan's and that was her, always her reason for not doing the cold. Her daughter would do it. Her daughter has cerebral palsy and her daughter would get in the ice bath and she'd feel more alive and more in tune with her body and more in control of her body than she typically would. And her daughter was eight when she started this practice. Wow. Now she would avoid this particular woman would avoid the cold because of the Raynaud's. It's painful. It's circulatory. It takes so long to come back for the feeling in her fingers. And Rain knots is circulatory. Mm -hmm. It's when all of the blood flow starts to leave our extremities. And it happens most often in the fingers and the toes, which are the furthest away from our heart. So if we develop a practice of constricting our circulatory system, our vascular system, and through the cold, and then we step out and that heat comes back into our extremities, what we're doing is we're creating a workout for our circulatory system in a way that it doesn't get any other way. Yeah. The only way to constrict our circulatory system, our vascular system in our extremities or anywhere is through cold water exposure, not cold air, yeah. cold water exposure. So by doing that, what you're doing is you're working out. It's like creating push-ups for your circulatory system. Yeah, absolutely. And now all of a sudden it's working out and it's getting exercise and it's doing its job whether it wants to or not, she now no longer has brain knots. That Through the practice of deliberate cold exposure, she did not use it in conjunction with sauna. It was strictly ice baths. And she has, she now no longer has brain knots. That's amazing. So sometimes the thing that you think is the thing that you don't need, the thing that you're avoiding because of your issue, you know, oh, I have brain knots, so I avoid the cold. It's exactly what you need in order to move through the condition. Love it. I love it. Okay. One more uh, cortisol. People with flat line cortisol or people with chronically high cortisol, again, like the flat line I can maybe see, I mean, you know, just from the perspective that people come in at it, they're like, oh yeah, you have very low cortisol. Well, this should jump it. This should bump it up. But people with very high cortisol, you would think again, I mean, I know what you're going to, I'm, I'm starting to get in, get in the groove here with you, but the very high cortisol people, how does this help them? And can it? Well, no matter liners. what, yeah, yeah. No matter what, when you step when you step into the cold, you're producing norepinephrine and dopamine. Yep. There is one other way we can produce norepinephrine and dopamine like this, and that's an orgasm. Okay. Some people might argue so, that it's more fun, but yes, <laughs> right. <laughs> it might be more fun, and this is quick. You don't you don't necessarily need to do much effort. You show up, you sit down, you breathe. Yeah. And you get this surge of norepinephrine and dopamine. This surge of norepinephrine and dopamine calms everything down in your system. And then all of a sudden, as your body's coming back online, it says, what's important? What do I need to focus on? When I first was introduced to the cold, I absolutely had adrenal fatigue. I absolutely had been overproducing cortisol my entire life. Oh, for sure. What this does is it helps level everything out. When you're producing norepinephrine and dopamine, you don't have to produce those stress hormones. You're not stressed out. You're not stressing yourself out. Even though you're putting your body in a stressor situation, a physical stressor situation, you're not stressing out your mind in the same way. And because you're stimulating the vagus nerve, you're producing that norepinephrine and dopamine, you're calming everything down. Then all the other systems get to start to operate the way that they're the way that they ought to operate. Yeah. 
Yeah. So it's leaving room for your body to do what it's supposed to do naturally. Well, what you're really saying is it brings homeostasis back online to every system in the body. Like really, yes, that's, and that's what we're ultimately after, right? We're after bringing, you know, because so many people talk about, oh, I want to boost my immune system, or I want to boost this, or I want to bring that down. And ultimately, you know, all of these ways of thinking is you're playing with fire because the best way to, the best way to optimizing your performance and your health is to come back to homeostasis. And, right. and what this is doing is it's like a reboot, really. It's mm-hmm. like a, it's a full yeah, system, I call it a full system reset, reboot. Right? Yeah, like it's going back to factory settings, you know, kind of thing where you just you just from this initial kind of shock and the man the way that you manage that shock and manage your way through it, and then the way that the body then, as to your point, it brings these systems back online. It's seeking to come back into a state of homeostasis. Yeah. And, and it's a lot different, you know, like when our, when our body creates a physical muscle memory from a state of fear yeah. versus when our body creates a physical muscle memory from this state of calm with all this dopamine and norepinephrine coursing through our system, it's got a completely different effect on our physical systems. Mm-hmm. So it's not like when I go to CrossFit and I'm working out to a point of utter exhaustion and then my body has nothing left to give Yeah, this, I show up, I sit down, I breathe and I've got everything to give. I've just been completely refilled, reset, refueled, and I'm ready to take on the world. Yeah. I love it. I love it. And so, um, so how long did it take you? How long in, into that cold exposure therapy? Because you had a lot going on, some of which was understood, some wasn't right. Yeah. Yeah. Two years, wow. two years. I lost in the first year. I lost uh, the first six months. I lost all 50 pounds. Hmm. Within the first year, I'd gotten rid of all the vitamins and supplements. The second year was me tapering off of prescription medications. So in August of 2019, when I went to my endocrinologist the last time and she pulled my labs, I did not tell her about any of the changes. I didn't tell her in that I was that I'd been off all prescription medication at that point for three months. Wow. And the hardest, believe it or not, the hardest the hardest medication to get off of was the allergy medicine. It wasn't the thyroid medicine. It wasn't all the stuff that was supposedly keeping me alive. It was the allergy medicine that actually felt like withdrawing off how I would consider like morphine or heroin. It was absolutely, it, it was a terrible experience. Um, and it took two years. And so I went into my endo, I got my labs drawn and she goes, Oh, everything you're doing is great. We're just going to keep you doing what you're doing. And I said, that's great. Cause I'm not doing anything. She's like, what? Or at least nothing like, you told me to do. <laughs> yeah. So I haven't been on medication for three months. I wanted an honest read of my labs. I didn't want to tell you because I didn't trust her. I don't, I did at that point, I definitely didn't trust anyone in the medical system. And she says, wow, that's great. I want you to, you know, ice baths. That's so cool. Low inflammation food regimen. Awesome. I hope I never see you again. And I got really excited. I thought, yeah, me too. I hope I never see you again. And then I walk out of the office and in the waiting room, there are a dozen other women overweight, unhappy, inflamed Mm -hmm. on multiple medications. And yet somehow we don't want to shout this from the rooftops. We don't want to tell these people that there are alternatives out there. So I started to become very angry in my healing process and decided from that point on, it was my job to shout these healing modalities from the rooftops to let people know that we can heal ourselves naturally. There's no such thing as chronic illness. There's no such thing as pills that are keeping you alive. No matter how many pills I ever took, my symptoms never went away. It only got worse until they added more diagnoses and more pills to my regimen and more things that I was supposed to be putting in my body that were not meant to ever be in my body. So two years, that's all it took two years to completely heal my body of autoimmune. Wow. That's impressive. And that's when this journey started, I would guess. So 2017 to 2019, almost, almost to the month. And so 2019 though, is when you decided to start your business. Like, is that when you decided to develop this practice into something you would share with other people? So how did that part happen? (laughs) That happened in tandem with me discovering the cold. So November 2017, I took my first ice bath. By the time I took my third ice bath, I developed this sensory immersive way of moving through the cold. 
Right. By 2018, we had our first prototype. We took it to an event and I was guiding other people. Nice. By 2019, I had developed the Marotsko method completely. I was taking on clients and helping other people heal themselves through the sensory immersive meditative practice for deliberate cold exposure. By 2020, I was certifying guides to do the same. Right. Now I have more than 50 certified Marotsko method guides throughout the U.S. and beyond. That's amazing. I love it. So let's for the business. Oh, and the business also developing the electric ice bath. Once my husband started to see the changes in me and the changes in him and in our business partner, they said, how do we get this? uh, How do we get access to this 24 seven? And there just wasn't a personal use model on the market. So they invented one. Right. 2019, January, we sold our first model. Wow. Which I got to tell you guys, you've got to go to these guys' website. It is a thing of beauty, but tell us a little bit about what it is about quite apart from the fact that it's in this gorgeous wood casing. And so you've got a metal tub inside, but it's a pretty sophisticated device because aside from the rubber duckies that were floating in the water, that was, (laughs) which were very comforting bobbing around. I'm like, they're not dead. Surely I can survive this. Um, (laughs) There was, there was, There was a certain amount of ice, like ice cubes, Mm -hmm. but, you know, this is a machine that's working all the time and it's got a great cover on it, which is great for safety. And I'm guessing for energy conservation to, to keep things steady. Um, And, you know, it's, as you say, it's an investment piece. Like it's not going to be for everybody. Not everybody's going to have, I mean, either the budget or maybe the space where to put it, but I'll tell you, if you've got a good cold practice and you have the space and the budget, this this thing is the bomb. This is the mamma jamma for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one of the things that sets us apart is we make ice. So our units are designed to create a layer of ice along the bottom. Once it reaches its desired temperature, controlled by a digital temperature thermometer, that ice releases and it'll repeat the cycle. Just like a refrigerator, you leave it plugged in and the refrigeration turns on and off as needed to maintain those temperatures. Okay. It's inside of a fully insulated wooden box that is handcrafted right here in Phoenix, Arizona. So all of our units are handcrafted. Every, no two units look alike because of the wood grain and the textures and the designs in the wood. So no two units look alike. Um, and we also offer a fully filtered fully filtered model with ozone disinfection. So it's a micron filtration with ozone disinfection. So our filtered models do not need any harsh chemicals whatsoever. They maintain crystal clear waters and freezing temperatures 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. On our filtered models, you do not have to change that water unless you have some sort of unexpected contamination. I'm talking like a party valve. So, um, (laughs) We do sometimes like to put Epsom salts in them because it's just a really good way to get that added magnesium. And we do have a base model that is refrigerated only, no filtration. If you're just trying to get your foot in the door on a Marotsko Forge, we also offer warranties cover to cover two year on cold and filtered and then cover to cover five year for our prism. Our top of the line has a full five year warranty. Um, again, like I said, these are handcrafted in Phoenix, Arizona, all set on a digital temperature control to maintain your desired temperature, whether that's 55, 45, or 35. And yeah, they're fantastic. They are big. They don't scrunch down. They are delivered fully assembled. You plug in, you fill up, you're good to go. Plug and go, baby. Plug and go. Yeah. I love it. Um, it's, it's something to see guys. I got to tell you. So, so Miss Adrian, this has been amazing as I knew it would be. Um, why don't you tell people where they can find you? Um, and also how to access your beautiful trainings for people who can't get to a Morosco coach, uh, or guide. And, um, we've talked about all the different ways they can access the cold. We can all access the cold. I'll go get my bowl of ice water ready now, um, <laughs> for, for before my next podcast, but, um, but yeah, why don't you tell us, tell people a little bit about how they can find you? Yeah. So you can find us on uh, Instagram at Marotsko Forge. You can find us on our website, www.marotskoforge.com. Also check out the journal articles on our website. We have a lot of really good information on healing, testosterone, diabetes, autoimmune, cancer, like you name it. We've got journal articles up there on it. And if there's anything on there that you don't see that you want to see, reach out to us at info at marotskoforge.com. You can also find me on Instagram at at Adrian underscore Jezik. 
or you can email me at info at moronskoforge.com. I will be releasing new trainings for the Moronsko Method Workshop in 2022. Those dates have not been released yet, but if you'd like to be put on the waiting list, just shoot me an email at info at moronskoforge.com. Please reach out, you guys. If you have questions, you can also go to our YouTube channel. We put a lot of good stuff on our YouTube channel about benefits of the cold, ways to practice. You can also find my deliberate cold exposure meditations there. And you can listen to the Morotsko Method podcast anywhere you listen to your favorite podcasts, where I share the journeys of people who have healed themselves through deliberate cold exposure. Love it. Thank you so much for having me, Natalie. It's been a pleasure getting to know you. And I look forward to making more magic with you in the future. Likewise, the feeling is completely mutual. And uh, yeah, I got to beef up my deliberate cold exposure. So I'm ready for the next time we meet. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. All right. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.